Welcome to What the Paper Said, in which I, Patrick Crozier, skim through the times from this week a hundred years ago, read some of the articles and comment on the ones I find interesting. This week the world is still reeling from the Turkish capture and destruction of Smyrna, Greece especially. This is from Thursday the 29th of September 1922. Near East Crisis. Revolution in Greece. King Constantine abdicates. And it says... King Constantine has again abdicated the Greek throne, to which he returned in December 1920, after the overthrow of M. Says M Venezuelos, I suppose that means Musha Venezuelos. His abdication is in favour of the diadoc. What on earth is a diadoc? Well, the internet is sometimes your friend, it would appear, sometimes your friend, it would appear to mean successor, but it goes back to the well, the Macedonian period, so I don't know. Anyway, it goes on the, in favour of the Diadoc George, but it is otherwise unconditional. Um, yeah, well, you lose war, that sort of thing that happens. Uh, the repercussions are also being felt nearer to home. Monday brought this. Mr Lloyd George made a long and important statement on the government policy in the Near East to a party of newspaper representatives who were invited to attend at 10 Downing Street on Saturday. Uh, probably worth pointing out that um, Parliament is not sitting at the moment. Uh, so that's why he makes an announcement to newspaper representatives, which seems awfully informal, rather than Parliament itself. Anyway, that's how he chose to do it. He says, Our action has been dictated by two supreme considerations. One is our anxiety as to the freedom of the seas between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. That is the first essential and primary consideration in dictating our action. What happened in the late war, he means the First World War, has demonstrated clearly to every mind, certainly in the British Empire, how vital the freedom of those narrow seas is to the security of the empire and to the protection of our commerce and to humanity in its broadest aspect. I find this ridiculous, but I'll, I'll, I'll go on. It was directly responsible for the collapse of our most powerful ally in that quarter of the globe. It was also responsible, he means Russia, it was also responsible for the defeat of Romania. These two disasters had the effect of prolonging the war by at least two years, and by that means adding enormously to the loss of human life and the devastation and destruction, which will take may, many years, if not a whole generation to repair. Well, I think he's somewhat overstating his case here. Now, it has to be said, there are those who claim, and, and certainly claimed at the time, you know, Winston Churchill, that uh, had the Gallipoli campaign been successful, that would have meant that Turkey was knocked out of the war, it would have meant that the, uh, the Western Allies would have found it, found it much easier to uh, supply Russia with guns and shells, I guess, um, and that the war, Russia would have stayed in the war, and that the war would have ended much sooner. I think this is pushing it shall we say really pushing it um you know first of all britain in 1915 for instance could not supply itself shelves and guns it had to ramp up its industry enormously uh and also the supply lines were incredibly long you know, that makes things very difficult it's very difficult to supply things quickly or when they're needed in the right quantities because you have to guess sort of you know three three months in advance how how, much, how many shells and guns are you going to need? Also, there's something a little bit, um, oh, I don't know, distasteful about the idea that the, the, the British should not be doing the fightings, the Russians should, and the, the, you know, the, the British should fight to the last Russian. Um, yeah, anyway, I, I think he's way over setting his case. After all, I mean, Russia didn't exit the war one year precisely, pretty much, before the, the war actually ended, so I don't think... Uh, it would, it would have been reduced by two years, um, or, or indeed much at all, frankly. Um, I think the, the Germans would have had no great difficulty. I mean, you, you think about how difficult it was for the Germans to uh, police Russia, or the bit of Russia they took, after the peace of Brest-Litovsk. They, they needed considerable forces there, so they would have needed considerable forces you know, anyway, whether they won the war or not. Anyway, I, so Lloyd George is overstating it. Anyway, but he's he's certainly um, in favour of robust action in in in, um, in Turkey. 
But not everyone is so gung-ho. This is from Tuesday the 26th. Stop the War meetings were held at Poplar yesterday evening under the chairmanship of Councillor S. March. Speeches against the participation of this country in war against any nation were made by the Mayor, Councillor C. C. Sumner, Mr. A. A. Watts, Miss Susan Lawrence, Alderman Muriel Lester and others. At the Town Hall a resolution was passed declaring that there was no cause for war and informing the government that in no conceivable circumstances would the people of Poplar support a war of any description. I should point out that it's always Poplar. Um, but before we dismiss this as a bunch of Bolshevik nonsense, here is an extract from a letter to the Times. While we are still mourning for nearly a million of our best sons, and daily seeing hundreds of thousands of our bravest men halt, maimed and blind as the result of the late war, it is inconceivable that we should allow ourselves to be drawn into another war, the limits of which it is difficult to define, unless the strongest possible reasons can be advanced to justify such a procedure. The um, implication being that here, the strongest possible reasons cannot be advanced. Um, I think it's I think it's worth dwelling on 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 those lines um, because it's it's very easy for us from the perspective, perspective of the twenty twenties to to condemn that generation for not seeing the the rise of Hitler and the threat of Hitler. But it's when we do, we, we ought to at least just be aware of, of what they've been through. Uh, and the sort of daily reminders, as, 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 as this guy says, of of the impact of that war. Everyone was affected, um, often very deeply. Um, anyway, um, I was going to say, uh, and he's not the only one, um, a version to what we found in the oddest of places. This is from Sir Ian Hamilton. If you don't know who so Sir Ian Hamilton was, he was a very respected general, and he was in command of the Gallipoli, Gallipoli, Gallipoli operation, obviously the disastrous Gallipoli operation, uh, a disaster from which his reputation never uh, recovered. Uh, I think it is worthwhile that pointing out that the Times military correspondent of the First World War, um, whose name <laughs> unfortunately escapes me, a court Rippington. Uh, anyway, he, his name escapes me. The internet is sometimes your friend. It's Charles Court Rippington, of course. Anyway, he was a he was a big fan of, of Ian Hamilton and and very much respected his judgment. Uh, it is quite possible, you know, to be a general who's just handed a, an unwinnable situation. Uh, anyway, this is what Hamilton has to say. Had we truly aimed at peace and the demilitarization of Europe instead of at the twenty-four thousand million sterling and the Kaiser's head held out like glittering baits to the people at the end of 1918, we might have inflicted a mortal wound on war. By the way, I one thing I really, really hate is is when you when people talk about um, costs in in historical costs, and of course. Um, this number here, 24,000 million sterling, 24,000 million pounds, um, of course, is very me almost completely meaningless to us. I mean, it's a big number, that's for sure, um, anyone's money. But, of course, there's been huge inflation since then. Um, so it's, if you want to, want to you know, I, I could give that number in today's 2020 pounds, but what, would, what use would that be in, say, five or ten years? Um the best I can do off the top of my head is make a gold conversion. That's not perfect either because um, that depends on the supply of gold, which luckily enough it actually tends to um, go, it's actually quite even, it's about 1 or 2% a year. Um, and it, But it doesn't say anything about how much effort it would be involved in, in, in this money. Um, people are a lot less productive in the 1920s than they are now. You may find that difficult to believe, but it's, it's true enough. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, but the best I can do, well, um, I can't quite remember the conversion. Actually, I will look that up now. Right, it turns out that the, um, the 1914 pound was uh, a quarter of an ounce of gold. Um, so when we're talking about 24,000 million sterling, we're talking about 8,000 million ounces of gold. No, sorry, 6,000 million <laughs> ounces of gold, which is... That's a colossal sum, that really is. Anyway, <clears throat> but let us turn away from this possible 
bloodshed, the very real bloodshed, to be found in the boxing ring. When I were when I were a nipper, um, you know, the the, the the heavyweight world champion was um, championship in boxing was dominated by black men, people like George Foreman, Joe Frazier, Ken Norton, and some other bloke whose name I forget. Um, and it's only recently that um, it turns out some white men can box. Well, they seem to be either, either Ukrainians or gypsies, from what I can figure out. A um, hundred years ago, it wasn't quite so clear that the sport was going to be dominated. But, but we'd already had Jack Johnson winning the heavyweight um, World Championship. Uh, and then I think he was banned from participating again. Um, well, we can, I think we can guess at the, at the reason why he was. And now we're having something similar at a, at a different uh, weight level. I can't remember what it was. But this is between Georges Carpentier, who was French. Yes, there were such things as French boxer. And a chap called Battling Sicky, who's, well, black. And Battling Sicky has won. But that is not the thing that the Times finds most interesting, as we shall see. This is from Thursday. Yesterday, after a day's delay, the film of the Carpentier Sicky fight was exhibited in London. The members of the great British boxing public are therefore now in a position to settle for themselves the why and the wherefore of the French champion's defeat, each according to his or her own liking and preconceived ideas. For that apparently is one of the properties of this particular film. It suits all tastes and fancies. At the private view in Paris, it convinced the already convinced manager of the beaten man that he was fouled by his opponent. With no less certainty, it proves in the opinion of the rival manager that he was not. It goes on. At the best of times, an umpire's or referee's work is in all conscience difficult and ungrateful enough. If it had to be checked by the camera before it could be examined and found correct or incorrect, it would become intolerable, and he and his kind would rapidly become extinct to the grave detriment of the true interests of sport. You've been warned, referees, you've been warned. In real life um, <clears throat> this week, you may have noticed a story about a Lord Rothermere uh, taking charge of the Daily Mail. Um, and oddly enough, spookily, we have this headline from uh, one day last week, I think it was Wednesday. Let's just check. Wednesday. 27th. The Daily Mail, Lord Rothermere, Chief Proprietor. Now what's happened here is that, if I remember correctly, the Times, the Mail and the Daily Mirror, would you believe, were all under the same ownership. Um, and that ownership being Lord Northcliffe. Lord Northcliffe's brother was Lord Rothermere. I'm not quite sure how Lord Rothermere got his, um, his lordship. By the way, this period, sorry. Uh, by the way, in those days, there weren't, I'm pretty sure there were no life peerages. If you got a peerage, it was hereditary. Um, anyway, Lord Northcliffe, the proprietor of the Times, has died and he's given his shares to his brother. So that's how the Rothermere's got charge of, got to be in charge of the Daily Mail. Now, I love, when, love it when something like that happens. But what I love even more is when private enterprise runs railways. London train services, faster and later facilities, improvements on the underground. The Underground Railway has recently made extensive additions to its rolling stock and has also carried out much re-signalling on various sections of the line so that, so that it is now possible to make many improvements in the train services. Faster trains will now be run on the District Railway and the running time to Ealing, Richmond and Wimbledon will be reduced by one to three minutes. A new train is that which will leave Mansion House at 6.30am for the Harrow and Hounslow lines. This will be a non-stop and will provide additional through travels facilities between South Harrow and the city. And they go on. The number of cars and circle trains is to be brought up to five. This is in the days when all London Underground lines were privately owned. They will be nationalised or given to the London County Council in 1934. But as you can see, despite the very real economic difficulties that Britain faces in the early 1920s, um, the railways are still continuing to improve. Anyway, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll have more delving into the archives next week.